ancient words, oh so true, changing me and changing who? Changing you. Um, as you leave, you notice we've been talking a lot about the Word. It's on your bulletin also about the Word. We believe the Word of God is a lamp onto our feet and a light onto our path. We believe the Word is Jesus Christ. He's God's thought made audible. So Jesus is the Word. We believe the Word of God changes and transforms us. And so before you leave, if you did not receive one of these, it's for February. It's the bookmark. And it has on there, you know, the catch up or you could just continue reading um, on the books of the Bible, the Old Testament. I know there's some visitors in our midst. We are so delighted, so thankful that you have chosen to worship with us today. We're just going to give you a connection card. We're very, very happy to have you in our midst. If you could just raise your hands um, and let us know who you are. You don't have to say a word. We're very, very thankful. Um, if I could have some of our small group or life group individuals, um, some I talked with and some maybe if you didn't get talked with or maybe I didn't mention to you, just come on up. I'll hold the mic, so I'm in control of the mic, um, and we'll just having some, some highlights. Small group individuals, life group individuals, um, come on up. If you have participated in a life group, come on up just very briefly. Um, wanted to share a few things with you. Just have a seat right here um, and come on down. We're going to show a video, and this video is from last Sunday. We had our God's Closet shop date, and I want you to just pay close attention. If we could turn the lights down. Thank you. opportunity to reach your people and so we pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit bless us Lord with your spirit and we thank you so much for this grand day in Jesus name amen, amen.
it, it was very, very moving that day. I mean, God really spoke through so many different ways in ministering to people. As we continue on, I want us to just know that God is calling us to do tangible things. And when you do tangible things, you don't have any strings attached. Even if they never accept God, you still do what God calls us to do. Even if they never come into your church, you still do what God calls us to do. Um, and so disinterested benevolence, you do it out of the goodness of our heart. And so we mentioned about the word of God. Um, and so we just want to continue just emphasizing this. All right, I'll have them come up and just a few of you will do share just highlights, key words. Come on up, all of you. Um, just come on up, come on up. They're just going to be sharing. If, if you could have one word or two words, so we're just limiting in one word or phrase, the blessings or what you have received from going to a life group, um, what would it be? Two words or one word or phrase? I would say uh, power. Power. Peace. Peace. Loving others. Loving others. Being wiser. Being wiser. Um, God, I, God guide you. Guide us. God's guidance. The truth. The truth. Many blessings. Many blessings. Power of God. Power of God. All right. So there are about six life groups, and so just look in the bulletin, and you could find a life group. Thank you all very much. Um, you could find a bulletin, and it tell in the bulletin it tells you about our life group. Um, last night I was at a group. Uh, and, and it was so powerful to be able to share as we were sitting around and we were eating together and we were talking and we heard about different life experiences that individuals had. I'll just say this and I'll whisper so you have to listen. The book of Acts is filled with life experiences of real human beings who were vulnerable with each other because God never judged them God didn't condemn them, and so they felt the same in the presence of fellow believers that they were not judged, they were not condemned, no matter what they did, and they were loved unconditionally. And that is the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I just want to run through a few little um, key things here. Um, we've do been doing a study on the book of Revelation um, the book of Ephesus, what would you identify the book of Ephesus as the take-home message? The book of Ephesus. It's seven, seven churches. There are seven letters to the churches in the book of Revelation, and they are relevant to us because they are very, very important. Um, seven letters Jesus sent to these churches. What would you say, the church of Ephesus? Return to your first love. Someone in the audience, the first time I mentioned this when we were talking about Ephesus, they said the church of Ephesus, they did a lot of good things, but they lack love. Someone in the audience that was sitting over there, a visitor, they said they would paint a picture in a word phrase that would remind them of Ephesus would be an old couple that have been married. They've been married for a long time. They do a lot of good things for each other, but they don't love each other. And that was the church of Ephesus. The church of Ephesus, they loved truth, but they didn't know the truth, Jesus Christ. They loved truth as in they, they wanted to be right with God, with everything, but they did, ha did not have a relationship with Jesus. And so they were legalistic. Church of Ephesus. You could love truth and be legalistic because you don't have the love of Jesus. And so you don't love people. And that was the church of Ephesus. How about Smyrna? Remember Smyrna? Did God give any criticism to this church? Did Jesus give any criticism to this church? No. They were going through a hard time. And Jesus introduced himself as the one that was dead and now is alive. And he knew that they were poor, but he says you are rich. They were rich in spiritual things. And he says, fear not. They were being persecuted. So the church of Smyrna. And so we, we could take home from this that God is with us. And he says, fear not. Um, Pergamum. How about Pergamum? Compromise. There was a compromising church. Um, Pergamum, um, they were not faithful all the way to God and so we saw with Balaam and so it was they loved the world and not the people in the world they loved the things of the world um, the lust of the flesh the pride of life um, the desires those desires of the heart and that was their downfall 
Um, today, we're going to be talking about another church, and it's Thyatira. Um, Thyatira, and the sermon title is Stand Up. Stand Up. If you would bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we want to take a stand for you, but it's humanly impossible. We want to be faithful to you, but again, it's humanly impossible without your spirit. But we thank you, Lord, that the Apostle Paul, who wrote the words, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And he also wrote, thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so, Lord, we can be overcomers. We could stand for you. We could stand in the midst of adversities. We could stand through trials and difficulty as you give us courage. Pour out your spirit upon us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So on Wednesday, we usually send in the sermon information um, to Judy to do the bulletin and I sent in and I said I don't have a title yet I've been praying and praying and praying and so it was on Thursday or maybe Wednesday night maybe I was doing little worship with our little boy Canaan and so my wife Holly she was taking care of the little baby the little one-year-old and taking care of her in the other room and so I did the worship by myself with Canaan and so Canaan pulled out his worship book. And by the way, we're so happy that God has given to us the Sabbath school information. And so I encourage mothers, fathers, caregivers, bring your children to Sabbath school. And so in his Sabbath school, he, he, he's reading about the book of Daniel in that one book that we were reading. And so he says, Dad, Dad, and we have the felts at home. And so he wanted me to go through and he ran and got the felts. And, and, you know, about, you know, the Nebuchadnezzar with the statue. And so we started reading, and then he brought this other felt. You can't see it. I'll show you a picture of it soon. But it's a picture of one like the Son of God in the midst of the fire. And right then, as I was reading to him the story, the title came, Stand Up. Stand up, because there's a parallel in the book of Daniel. By the way, Daniel is the key to unlock Revelation. Daniel is the key to unlock Revelation. And so um, we're going to be having our young ladies, and so he says use 8 and 9. So what number do you have? Okay, here you go. We're very happy to have Secure. Remember, Secure and Ali, they've preached before. And so they're going to join me, and they're going to be reading. And by the way, um, you have your sermon notes, and so you could follow along in your sermon notes with them. You go ahead and come on up, and um, they're going to be sharing mics. They're going to be reading from the book of Revelation, chapter 2, 18 to 29. Tire, tire. Lord, pour out your spirit upon your word. These are words that Jesus sent to the church in Tire, tire. But Lord, we believe they are relevant today. Pour out your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. As the pastor said, we're going to be reading in Revelations 18 through 29. And 18 starts with, And to the angels of the church, Tire, tire write, these things say in the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your words, love, service, faith, and your patience, and as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I, <laughs> nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prof prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual morality and eat things sacrificed to idols and I give her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent indeed I will cast her into a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her unto great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds I will kill her children and death and all her ch churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts and I will give to each of you according to your words. Now I say and rest in the Thyatira as many as do not I have this doctrine who have not known the depths of Satan. As they say, I put on you no other burden. But hold fast what you have t 
until I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I give my power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels. As I also have received from my father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. All right, ladies, I want to ask you a question. From reading this letter to the church, what do you gather that Jesus is talking to them about? Anything that speaks to your heart, maybe a word, a phrase. Is there something in this letter? If you were reading this letter for yourself from Jesus, what is something that is talking to you um, that spoke to your heart? Maybe verse 9. Okay, so go ahead. Verse 19. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. So he knew their works, right? He says, I know your works. How about you, Secure? I'm thinking 20. They're holding things against you because um, even though they have sinned, they have given them time to repent, and they have not repented. So God has given them time to repent. So what do you learn about God from this letter? I think God's saying that he knows what you're going through and he's trying to help you even through the times that you need and the worst times. Maybe God cares. Because God he cares. You, he gives you time. God gives us time. God cares. All right. Thank you, ladies. You can have a seat. Amen. So as we see, this, this is a very important letter. And so I want to ask you a question. If Jesus were to send a letter to this church, remember all seven letters have a little different message. Two letters do not have any criticism. Two letters. So if God were to send, if Jesus sent a letter to First Church, addressed to First Church, it's blank. What would be some of the things, don't say it out loud, just think about your own life. What would be some of the things Jesus would be able to commend you to give you confirmation and saying, this is a commendation. Um, you are faithful in this. What would be some of the areas that he would say, you know, I have this against you that I, I notice that you're not faithful in this area. You follow what I'm saying? So if Jesus were to send a letter to you, so I want you to think about that and ponder it. And so God wants us to have a real relationship with him. As we've been going through, we said there are five C's of Jesus' letter, right? And it's in your sermon notes, by the way. Five C's. There's a characteristics of the sender. And so we'll look right away and find out what is the characteristic of the sender in this letter that we see off the bat. Do you realize there's something about the sender? What does Jesus address himself as in this letter? letter. Do you re recall? He is the what? The Son of God. What do you think of when you think Jesus saying the Son of God? It's the only time in Revelation Jesus even addresses himself as the Son of God. What comes to your mind? Majesty. Power authority because Jesus said in the book of Matthew 28 all authority have been given to me in what heaven and on earth right all power so he says I'm the son of God by the way in the four gospels the son of God or the deity or God sending his son in the form of human humanity so Jesus is God himself the fourth gospel emphasizes this point. So if you want to look more into this, read the Gospel of John. Anything else that comes to mind about the Son of God? The Son of God. Love. God is love. It's an attribute of God. God is love. 
I want you to just direct your attention, and this is the little felt that I was talking about, that I was reading for my son, and it depicts how many in the fire? Four, but how many were thrown in the fire? Three. And so they were saying, we, didn't, we, didn't we throw three into the fire? But we see one like the Son of God. And so here we see the Son of God is in the midst of these men as they were standing up for truth. And by the way, they said, and you read this in Daniel chapter 3, that they said, even if God does not deliver us from the fire, meaning even if they will die in the flames, they will still remain faithful and not bow down. They were going to take a stand. God is calling you and I to take a stand now. God is calling you and I to say, you know what? And it's okay to this very day go, you know, take an inventory and you go, maybe with your spouse, your wife, your children, and you, you have a little talk and you say, you know what, kids? We've not been faithful in what we should have been doing in raising you this way to learn about God. We've not been faithful what it says in the book of Deuteronomy 6, that when you rise up, by, when you lay down, when you sit down, when you walk by the way, we should be guiding your footsteps to learn about God. And you could say, be truthful, we have not been faithful in doing those things. But dear friends, today is the ninth, and we're going to be, by God's grace, be faithful to Him. Amen? You're going to say, as Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm telling you, the world has nothing to offer any of us. So you may think, well, the world have peace. You know, I see, I see on TV and all these young people, they're so happy and they're showing these Budweiser commercials. They're happy and they're showing you all this stuff and they're happy. It is a lie. Because I read their Twitter account and I see all the different atrocities and the evils and the things that they are, they're ensnared with. I see and see all these young, peoples who are, who, young people who are committing suicide because they have no peace and they're tormented. So anyone could smile for a Photoshop or photo shoot. Anyone could do those things, but God is saying, young people, older people, take a stand for God because Jesus says, in me, you will have peace. In the world, you will have trials and difficulties. And Jesus says, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So I look at the world and it's fast fleeting. It smells good. It looks good. But it is rotten. And so these Hebrew worthies, they stood for God, and they were young men, by the way. They were teenagers when they went to Babylon, and they remained faithful to God. And so we see this, and so Jesus introduces himself as the Son of God. The Son of God, the very same one who was there with the Hebrew worthies in the fire. Daniel chapter 3, I alluded to it, and here it is. It says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, What did he say? Did we not cast how many? Three men bound into the midst of the fire. They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see how many? Four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire. And they're not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Jesus is who he said he is. I am convinced that I have peace when I'm on the side of Christ. I'm convinced, and you know, I was on a prayer line on Thursday. And the theme on Thursday for the North American Division, for Canada, United States, Bermuda, the Micronesian Islands, all of us were on a prayer call beginning at 9 o'clock Central Time. 
And there was a lady from North, from, um, North Carolina that was sharing, and the theme was, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Do you know what the gospel is? Does anyone know? It is the good news. And so the good news, it is the good news because in the, in the times past when a kingdom would go to war, when they would have their soldiers go to war, and so the king would be probably in the palace or in the rear, and they would send a messenger maybe galloping on a horse or running, and they would call him a herald. And the, the messenger, if they won the war, they would come with victorious banners and says, We have won! They were her heralding the good news, the God spell, which is what we call gospel. And so they would herald this good news. And so on Thursday, the young lady that was leading out, and the, the theme again was, it's found in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel. And she brought us back to the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve, they were naked, but the God of heaven had clothed them in a light protecting them. And they were not ashamed. But then they ate of the fruit when the serpent tricked and beguiled them. One was deceived, the other just followed into the deception and so they ate of this fruit, their eyes were open, and then they lost the covering, the protection of God, and realized they were naked. They became ashamed. And so she mentioned that Jesus, God himself, went there in the garden and clothed them with animal skin, representing how Jesus covers our shame. He covers our guilt with his blood. And so we're not ashamed of the gospel. And this is where Jesus Christ comes in the whole picture. That he gives us freedom from sin. And he says, take a stand and you will experience this. And so they saw one like the Son of God. As we continue reading through this passage, something else that comes to my mind in verse 19, in your sermon notes, verse 19, it says, I know your what? Works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. All the churches, Jesus begins by introducing who he is. He gives a characteristic of who he is. And then he says, I know. Remember, we talked about Jesus doesn't go, I know. He says, I know. Right? His, his arm around you. He is reasoning with us. He knows. So he's saying, listen, you cannot hide. Be real with yourself. What you're doing in darkness, it is destroying you. There are certain creatures that only operate nocturnally in darkness. The predator-prey syndrome. But Jesus says, I am the light. I banish darkness. I want to give you peace. And so he says, I know. And the thing he's saying to them about what he knows is this. He said this. That they were what? You notice what it says? I know your works. You're what? What are the things he says? You're what? Love, service, faith, and patience. So listen to this. The first two are motives. The first two are what? Motives. Your works and your love. Those are motives. The second are deeds. The second are what? Deeds. Works and love go together. Service and faith go together. So you see, they had love for others. It had produced service. Faith in Christ had assured perseverance in their commitment to him. So you see it again. Love for others produce service. So Jesus is saying, you do these things. But here's a, a very important point. In the eyes of Christ, an active church does not always mean a faithful church. You notice they were doing things, right? They had love for others, and it made them do service. They had faith in Christ, and they were assured of their perseverance in their commitment to Him. 
But being active does not always mean a faithful church. As we continue on with the no, Jesus says, I know. And I love what it says in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 39. Then here in heaven your dwelling place and forgive and act and give to everyone according to all his ways whose heart you what? And then in parentheses it says what? For you alone know the what? Hearts of all the sons of men, meaning all the women, children, all the inhabitants of the earth. This should not scare us that God knows you. He is a creator. He knows. The very hair on your head and on my head, they're numbered. He says you are of more value than many sparrows. So he's not going, I know. He is going, I know. But he wants us to know that he knows. Because if we think we're hiding from God and everyone else, we will continue in sin. We will continue harming our lives and our relationship with God. So God is desiring for us to come to the realization. Again, he compliments them, but he has some criticism, and we're just going to wrap it up. Some criticisms are found, and he says in verse 20, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman who? What's her name? Jezebel. Remember the Bible in the book of Revelation, in the book of Revelation chapter 1, it was signified, meaning symbolic. There are lots of symbolism. So there are allusions to, allusions to, the Old Testament, and there was a woman by the name of Jezebel. I have a question for you. Have you ever met a girl by the name of Jezebel? And you could Google it. It has never got on the top five most popular girl names globally. Why do people refrain or stop from naming their children Jezebel? Bad reputation. She was a queen and her husband was what? What was his name? Ahab. And this woman, Jezebel, caused God's people to turn away from God in idolatrous worship. Today, there are idols and big images and statues. Did you know there's a big statue in Tulsa, in Broken Arrow? There's a Buddhist temple there. Did you know that? I lived in a Buddhist country before in Korea. I was Buddhist before. So I used to bow down to many, many different idols and gods and whatever you want to call it. But today, we could have idol worship. Your wife could be your idol. Your husband could be your idol. Because we should put God, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Your computer could be your God. Your TV could be, you see, it's a modern thing, right? So we go, oh, you got uh, uh, someone in the sound booth, they're waving the cell phone. How much time? Because you see, all it is, is how much time you're taking away from the true God. So it's real tricky because it's addictive. When you have a chance, watch on 60 Minutes, brain hacking. Brain hacking, how the computer industry hacks your brain. This was on 60 Minutes. They hack your brain. Apple Computer, they hack your brain. Facebook, they hack your brain to make you want to do all. You hear a chime and it gets your attention, you produce certain chemicals in your body and dopamine, it makes you feel good when you see a thumbs up, it's brain hacking at the expense of God. It's real tricky. It's the 21st century. Young people, mothers and fathers, I am simply saying this. If I were walking down the street and I heard someone say, there is a terrorist in this neighborhood. 
and they're doing these things to the children, do you think I'm going to let my little boy go and play with them? And so these devices are good, but be wise in what your kids watch and do on these things. And so this woman, Jezebel, she is symbolically mentioned here. She was a named wife after the Old Testament King Ahab. And she corrupted the faith of Israel by introducing idolatrous worship of Baal. So do an inventory again. Everyone should have received a green piece of paper. If you did not receive a green piece of paper, just raise your hand. If you need pens, they have pens. What we're going to do is, we're going to have you write on that paper. Don't put your name on there. You're going to write on that paper something that you may be struggling with. No one will know it. It will just be a paper with no names. We're going to be praying over those throughout the week, throughout the days. Praying for God to give us victory. Dear friends, there is no shame in this. You could just write on there, you know what, I need to overcome X, Y, Z. I need to overcome this. Whatever. You don't have to write a phrase. Just write a word and fold it and no one will know who wrote what. Because remember, God, Jesus says, I know. And he's simply wanting us to go, I know you know and you are the only one that can help me. And so here it is, Lord. I'm putting it in this box by faith and I'm praying that you would help me through this. Remember, the church in Tyre, Tyra, they were not faithful to God. There were some faithful ones, but the church at large was not faithful. By the way, this is not an exhaustive study. This would take a long time to go through it. I'm giving you highlights. I'm focusing on one point, faithfulness to God. We talked about the words of the Son of God who has the, the eyes like the flame of fire. It's talking about Jesus. And he stands with us in our fires. And we have enough pens, we have enough papers, and we just write on there. There's something you're saying, Lord, I want to overcome this. By the way, did you know that you inherit things from your fathers and your grandmothers? So parents, own up to some of the stuff we pass on to the kids. And we're praying that God will break the generational curses, whatever it may be. I'm struggling with this. I'm str I need help, Lord. I'm crying out to you because I can't take a stand for you because this is keeping me down and I need your intervention. I need your intervention. More than ever before, I just sense God is saying to me, Michael, you've got to give up all the stuff that you're, you're desiring that I don't desire. Just give it up. Surrender it all, Michael. Give it all to me. And so God has been going through this inventory with me. And yeah, give that up. It's no good. It will destroy you. Yes, it will. As we're closing here, you see the picture on the screen. These faithful young men we're taking a stand. Jesus said, To those who overcome, I will give him the morning star. Jesus is desiring for us to overcome. I want to paint a picture as we come to a close. How many of you have ever seen hostage situation? Maybe you were old enough to hear about the Iran hostage situation. What, what hostages usually do, um, hostage takers, they usually parade their hostage. It's called shock and awe. They want to create in your mind fear of those who are looking because they're showing you maybe an AK or something and usually what do they have over their eyes? They're blindfolded. They put a hood over them. What do they do with their hands? They shackle them, their feet, they shackle them. Hostage takeover. 
Did you know the biggest hostage takeover is not what you've ever seen in any history with the FAA, with an airline being hijacked by a terrorist from any part of the world? That is not the biggest hostage takeover. ISIS have never mounted the biggest hostage takeover. Did you know that? Al-Qaeda has never mounted the biggest hostage takeover. Abu Sayyaf in Asia, in the southern part of the Philippines, in Mindanao, have never mounted the biggest hostage takeover. You know who has mounted the biggest hostage takeover? Satan. So when, I, when I'm thinking about in life now, people are blindfolded. I'm walking around and they're blindfolded people all around me. They're shackled because Jesus is the only one that can deliver us from, from evil and the shackles of sin. And so I'm beginning to now just walk around. I go into a place and I'm only thinking a hostage takeover. I'm in the Walmart and I'm thinking there's a hostage takeover in here. People are smiling because usually hostages, they tell them what to do. You smile in front of the camera. You see when they have hostages in North Korea, they have them. It's all propaganda. You smile big. Tell them you're having a great time. Send us five million dollars and release us, mom. So people, when I walk around in, in Walmart, I see them. It's a hostage takeover. And Jesus, the son of God, he is saying, you know what? I need my people to stand up because they have to share the message, the good news, that Jesus, if the son of man has set you free, you are what? You're free indeed. I don't know about you, but God has freed me from some messed up stuff. So I believe in what Jesus says in the book of Mark. No man can enter into a strong man's house and take the hostages unless he first bind the hostage taker. That's what Jesus said. And so Jesus is the strongest hostage taker taker the one who could take the, the biggest one down Jesus because when he was nailed to the cross Satan thought ha, okay we, we do this to hostages we beat them we do this to hostages we spit on them we do this to hostages we emotionally abuse them we do this to hostages we strip them naked we do this to hostages to break them down but Jesus died on the cross and then on Sunday morning the Bible says that he rose again he rose again I believe it is only Jesus that can deliver us from the bondage of evil he sets us free we can walk out here not looking behind us because I know when he sets us free, when a hostage situation takes place, if they call in Delta Force, and I knew one Delta Force person because when I was stationed at West Point, one Delta Force person I knew in the entire military. He never talked much. He would go to different places. When they call a Delta Force unit in and they go to a hostage situation, they escort the hostages out. When they have subdued or annihilated the hostage takers, then they evacuate them out. And so Jesus is the hostage deliverer. And he is the one who comes in, just like Secret Service with our president. And he walks by our side. And he says, stand up. Don't be afraid. Because there's more with us than with them. He says, stand up, Michael. Don't be afraid. Take a stand for God. And so there's repentance. And there are four options that you have. Four opportunities. If you have your sermon connection cards, just pull that out. And there are four opportunities you could put on this. You could say, you know what? Lord, I accept you as my Savior. The second is repent and turn totally away from sin. Because it destroys us. It's awful. And third, it says, take a stand for God in all areas of your life, in your marriage, at your job, being honest and faithful in your job, in your time you work, 
being honest with your neighbors, being loving and kind in every way, even with the people who don't dress like you, don't act like you, don't believe like you. Take a stand for all areas and show God's love to all these people. And Ford, sign up for the life group. It's out on the desk. Jesus is coming soon. I believe he's just loving. He is loving. As the ladies said earlier, the young ladies, they talked about God is a God of love. He's a God who is faithful. As you stand to your feet, and we want to keep our eyes on Jesus. As we sing our final and closing song. Maybe you're weary, and the song says, Oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness I see. There's light at the look at the Savior. A life more abundant and free. And it says, it's an invitation. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace.